Praise God. Amen. Let me take a moment to pray for you, and you can be seated. Lord Jesus, just thank you so much for what's about to happen, the transformation of a life, a new beginning in you. Lord, I just pray that she learns to surrender her life fully to you. Lord, that it's an everyday walk. And God, I just pray for anybody else standing in this room, if there's a decision that needs to be made, that they come forward at this point in time. Lord, you're an open invitation. God, we love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Hello, hello, good morning, and I have my friend Brooklyn with me today, and we were standing out in the hallway just a few minutes ago, and I said, Brooklyn, why do you, and we've already had this discussion, but remind me, why do you want to get baptized? And she said, because I believe in God, and it's that simple, and it's that truth um, that brings us here to our baptism waters today, and and Brooklyn, she's ready to, to follow after God with her life. And we get to be witnesses of that, and we get to, long, get to come alongside of her and help her grow in her faith as she continues uh, on her next step. So, Brooklyn, if you would repeat the good confession after me, that would be wonderful. She's very shy and nervous right now, if you can't tell. All right, so we're going to make this as easy as possible. Brooklyn, repeat after me. I believe, I believe. that Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And I want to make him the Lord of my life. And I want to make him the Lord of my life. Amen. All right, I'm going to pray while she she has asked Don to baptize her. So I'm going to pray while they get they get ready, and then Don's going to baptize her. Father, we thank you for Brooklyn, and we thank you for her family, and we thank you that um, you have uh, used the Holy Spirit to speak into the truth into her life. And Lord, we just ask now that we, as a church, surround her with love, surround her with teaching, and surround her with comfort as she grows in her Christian walk. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. That is always a celebrated thing for us to share in on a Sunday morning, and uh, so I'm glad we all had that opportunity to experience that. Well, good morning. morning. Yeah, nice brisk day outside today, right? Um, What was it, 10 days ago, we had a snowstorm, a few inches, and just, what, two days ago, we had an ice storm, and... You know, those weather people, they're saying something again, right? Thursday, Friday, this week. So I guess you can tell we're in January because that's what happens in January. I want to start off this morning the message by focusing on a verse. And this will be the verse that pretty much everything that we're talking about today, it's all going to be orbiting around this verse and what is communicated in this verse. Now, it's a pretty interesting verse. In some ways, people find the verse puzzling. But in other ways, people find this verse clarifying. So it can kind of have both um, impacts uh, on different people. So here it is. And by the way, this is the memory verse that's on your outline sheet. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, and it reads this way. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Let me read it again, and just before I do, just to refresh your memory, this was the Apostle Paul who wrote a considerable amount of the New Testament that uh, was uh, beginning to write his first letter here to the church in Corinth. He would end up writing two letters 
Um, but he communicates something here because he had previously spent some time there in Corinth uh, with this infant church. And, and so he's reflecting back on that when he says this, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, that's a pretty significant statement that he's making. And just, just so that you know the New American Standard Bible isn't kind of going rogue here and saying something that, you know, really doesn't jive with what other translations are saying, let, let, me, let me just quickly share what some of the other translations say for this verse. They say things like this. I decided to deal with only one subject, Jesus Christ, who was crucified. Another one said it this way. I decided I would forget about everything except Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. Another one. I deliberately kept it plain and simple. First, Jesus and who he is. Then Jesus and what he did. One last one. I decided to only speak of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. As you can see, the New American Standard Bible that I've got on the screen, uh, it is totally consistent with what all these other translations are saying. Slightly different words, but the very same message. And in fact, the message that is found there is impacted even more when you consider, you know, the verse that precedes it. So in some different translations, this is what verse 1 of that chapter, and some of you already got your Bible open, so you're seeing the way it's phrased in one translation. But here are some of the other translations. I did not come with superiority of speech. Okay, so Paul made that statement before he got into that. Another one. I did not come with fancy words. Or... I did not come with eloquence. And one last one. I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches. And then he made that statement. And so it's pretty easy to come up with a summation of what is being said here in these first two verses of this chapter. And in my words, I would say it's something along these lines that, that Paul is is declaring to them, I did not use any big 50 cent words when I was with you. I just focused on the subject of Jesus and his crucifixion. Okay, so there, there it is. That's how the chapter begins. Now, the puzzling part of this is that there are so many other potential topics that Paul could have been talking about. But he's declaring very clearly here that, no, this was the topic. This is, this, this is pretty much the thing that, beyond everything else, I focused on. But, but there would have been other popular topics. Paul could have talked about eschatology, which is the study of end times. I mean, that always draws a crowd. People like to know stuff like about, you know, the coming, the second coming of Jesus or how the end times are going to play out, Judgment Day and where that falls into play. And, and I mean, that would draw a crowd, so to speak. But Paul's like, no, nah, I've got something more important to talk about, that right there. Or he could have talked about what happens after death. I mean, that's a subject that, that piques a lot of people's interest, especially if you have a loved one who has passed away or if you've had a brush with death yourself. Then that would be a subject that, uh, uh, yeah, that would draw you out. You, you would want to hear what uh, has to be said there. That would be a topic of interest. But Paul's like, no, no, no. I got something more important I want to focus on. Or Paul could have, could have uh, focused his attention, at least in part, in talking about the spiritual conflict in the spiritual realm. He could have talked about angels. He could have talked about demons. I mean, whenever someone writes a book about stuff like that, it almost immediately becomes a bestseller. Everyone wants to hear about things like that. But Paul's like, nah, I'll leave that to someone else to talk about. I am going to focus on this. Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
Now, when you step back and you start looking in other passages in the New Testament, you begin to see why this was the main thing that he taught. Let me show you another verse. Now, that, by the way, is your memory verse, you know, this week. It's a good verse to commit to memory because it reminds you of what is front and center. But uh, I'm going to show you another one. That's a really good verse, and it goes hand in hand with this. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And by a quick glance into Acts chapter 4, it becomes rather obvious. He's talking about Jesus here. That is the subject matter. But the point is very clear that's being made in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There is salvation in no other name. You know, now, it's appropriate to understand this concept of salvation within the context that is found in the book of Acts, but for that matter, what is found throughout all of the rest of the New Testament as well. We're talking about salvation being saved from our sin and the consequences, the ultimate consequence of our sin, and that being separation from God. The Bible is very clear about that, that ultimately that is the consequence to sin. And by the way, we all have participated in sin. We are all guilty guilty is charged, and just like Adam and Eve, they, they were separated in their relationship with God, kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and so the Bible does teach that, like passages like Isaiah 59 verse 2, it says, your transgressions have caused a separation between you and God. Okay, so, so that is a message that is delivered in the Bible, but yet salvation you know, what passages like, like this passage is talking about, salvation is that we are saved from our sin. And there's no other name under heaven given among men by which that is possible than the name of Jesus, that we are saved from our sin and from that ultimate consequence of sin. After having been arrested and and held for the night, this is what Peter and John were declaring to the authorities, that statement. And so what that means, in part, is that Joseph Smith, to use a sample name, nope, you can't be saved by that name. Mary Baker Eddy, the things that she taught and she wrote have still been passed down for generations and has many followers. Nope, can't be saved by that name. Buddha, Muhammad, nope, nope. Charles Taz Russell, nope. As a matter of fact, you can even open up the Bible, portions of the Bible, especially the Old Testament, which, which uh, we all hold this name high in high regard, and so do the Jewish people. Moses, nope, can't be saved by that name. We could take current or fairly current names uh, that are held in high regard. Billy Graham, nope. There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. Now, some of these other names and a host of others that I could use as examples, they, uh, when you look at those names, there is religion attached to those names, no doubt about that, but that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about religion. We're talking about salvation. Salvation is attached to only one name. There is no other name given among people by which we can be saved. And that would include... My name. Now, I'm not trying to be cute by saying this. I really want to make a point by this. But the name Brad Fangman, nope, nobody can be saved by that name. And I say that because there was a point in time years ago when I was operating under the thought process that, you know, by being a good person, at least a good person often enough, that God certainly wouldn't refuse me entry into heaven. I mean, I fully would have admitted back in the day if you would have 
have met me when I was young, I would have acknowledged that there was a fair amount of things that, that I had done and participated in that would have embarrassed my parents had they known about that. But at the very same time, I recognized the reality that God sees all and knows all, and God was already aware of it. But yet I was still operating under the assumption that as long as I'm a good enough person enough of the time that when the end of my life rolls around, when it all shakes out, I'm going to get into heaven because my good is going to outweigh my bad that I've produced in my life. And I'm not alone in that kind of thinking because there's probably a bunch of you in here that had that kind of thinking and maybe even some that are still operating under that notion today. But it's a bogus notion. There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. And that includes your name. And that includes my name as well. Several years later, after this particular incident, when John and Peter were talking to the authorities in Jerusalem, you know, we come to this other passage in Acts chapter 16. This involves Paul and Silas. They have been arrested in Philippi. They have been beaten and they've been put in the inner prison. Remember this story? An earthquake plays out in the middle of the night. The jailer rushes in, you know, to the prison and he sees the cell doors broken open and all of this, and he immediately jumps to the conclusion that people have escaped. And so he begins pulling out his knife, his sword, and he's going to plunge it into himself. He's going to take his own life because he knows what the consequences are that uh, if prisoners escape under his watch, he's going to have to pay for that with his own life. And so he's just going to go ahead and do it right now. But then all of a sudden a voice speaks out. Paul says, don't, we're all still here. The jailer rushes in to where Paul is and takes Paul and Silas and brings them out. And then the jailer says this, sirs, what must I do to be saved? I'm glad he asked that question. I mean, it's a pretty simple question, but it's a a very profound, significant question. So I'm glad it's in black and white in the Bible that, that question being asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And then here's what happens immediately following that. So they, being Paul and Silas, said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and your household. What was it that verse was saying in Acts 4, 12? There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Oh. Well, that's why they said what they said, because it all, everything hinges on Jesus. So they said, they answered the question, the question being, what must I do to be saved? And the answer being, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. Basically, they explained it. They kind of fleshed it out a little bit, what they meant by that statement, And then it says, he took them the same hour of the night and washed the wounds, and immediately he and his family were baptized. They were baptized into Christ. Now, you know, and just to remind you, this is all happening while the vast majority of Philippi was still in their bed sleeping. This is in the middle of the night. This really wasn't a convenient time for all these things to to happen, but from the jailer's perspective, convenience had nothing to do with it. He was wanting to know what, to be, what, what was involved in being saved. And so Paul and Silas, they spelled it out to him, and he followed through with it. Let me show you another passage that drives us home. Actually, this passage I'm getting ready to show you is a passage that I've used several times with people at critical moments of their life when they were at the very tail end of their life. Um, I've got in my mind, you know, multiple situations where I was either standing at the bedside, the hospital bed, or I was sitting in a chair um, right next to a bed of someone who was hours away from dying. 
um, or in a couple of the cases, they were just, just a handful of days, a few days away from dying. And, but yet they were coherent enough, we were able to converse. And there's something about that that, that uh, even what we would categorize as being good church folk, people that have been a part of church and, and you know, have loved the Lord for years, that there is a percentage of those people at the very tail end of, end of their life when, when uh, I mean, reality really hits you like a Mack truck that, you know, okay, this is the moment, this is the time, it's about ready to happen, that if there were doubts that had been lingering in their mind, but they were able to suppress those doubts, those doubts at this particular moment in time that I'm describing have a way of coming to the forefront of a person's mind. You know, and it's, it's understandable why. Uh, it would make them nervous. And so I've had, I've had people say to me, how can I know for sure? I mean, what I've believed is such and such, but, uh, but I'm just so nervous, I don't know. I just don't know. And in settings like that on multiple occasions, this is the go-to passage that I start with when I'm responding to those kinds of questions at that moment in a person's life. It's 1 John chapter 5, verses 11, 12, and 13. And the, the writing of 1 John is a very short writing, but it's pretty significant in what it's stating. The theme, basically, of 1 John is this: these are the things we can know. These are things we can know as believers. Okay, That's pretty much the theme of the book. But here's what, in the very tail end of the book, what John writes. This is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. That's a reference to Jesus, obviously. The one who has the Son has life. Okay, let me reread that. It's a, it's a pretty short verse, uh, sentence, but, but it's a significant sentence, and totally goes hand in hand with with Acts 4.12 and why Paul said what he did in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2, I determined to know nothing while, while I was with you except Jesus Christ. It says the one who has the Son has life. But just as significant of a sentence is the next one, the one who doesn't have the Son of God does not have life. And what he's talking about here is is in regards to the afterlife, eternity. And then he says this in verse 13. I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know. That's kind of been the theme of the book. And now he's coming toward the end of, of his writing. And like, man, this is the capstone. I'm writing these things Do you believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life? It all hinges on Jesus, which is the very thing that these other verses that we've already talked about are communicating. The person who has the Son of God has life. I mean, that is the bottom line. Part of the point of uh, that's being made here is that you don't have to lose sleep fretting about what's going to happen when you cross over that threshold from the now to the afterlife. It doesn't need to be a troubling thought. The key is that everything has to do with where you stand with Jesus. This is why building a relationship with Jesus is more important than anything else that you can accomplish in your life. It is more important, I'll say it again, than anything else you can accomplish in your life. Now, you might be at a certain stage in your life that you've still got three or four things or something or other, you know, a a little list that you operate with that may be written down or it might just be in your mind that these are things I really need to accomplish in my life. And, And more power 
power to you if, if uh, you've got a list like that, that that you're operating on. But for the record, I want to say that none of those are more important than this. This is the most important thing of all because eternal life is found in Jesus Christ. Let me remind you of something at the very tail end of Jesus' earthly life that is recorded in John chapter 14. Jesus, he hasn't gone to the cross yet, so the whole death, burial, resurrection, that hasn't happened yet, but it's, it's imminent, it's at hand, it's going to happen very soon. Um, and and what, what, what if you study the context here, the immediately preceding context, you're going to see that Jesus is, I mean, he's being pretty direct with his disciples. For example, he has this exchange with Peter, and he says, Peter, before the night is done, you're going to deny me three times. He also makes a statement, one of you, and he's talking to his disciples, the apostles. He's, he's saying, one of you is going to betray me. He doesn't specifically mention who that is in saying so, but, but uh, you know, we all know who that is. And he's also saying, I'm going to be leaving you all very soon. Okay, that's kind of distressing. For people that have been following Jesus and putting all their hopes and dreams in him and, and, and you know, what, what he has been teaching and representing and everything, I mean, that kind of stuff would really rattle your cage. So they were distressed. And that's why in this passage, that's found at the very beginning of John chapter 14, Jesus says what he does. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I'm going to be going there to prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, then I will come back and take you so that you might be where I am. You know the way to the place that I'm going. But then Thomas kind of speaks up first, and he says, we don't know the way. Tell us the way. And then this is when Jesus says, a verse that you have heard before, most likely. Jesus says this, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Which to totally jives with what Peter and John said in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. And it certainly helps shed light on why Paul said what he did in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2, I determined to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus and him crucified. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And just for the record, the definite article, the, is found in that verse multiple times. Jesus was not saying, I am a way and a truth and a life, though in today's modern world, there are numerous types of religions and, and uh, uh, doctrinal groups that uh, uh, would, would say, well, well, yeah, we don't have a problem with that understanding it that way because they operate under the assumption that there's multiple different ways to God will all end up at the same place. And Jesus is one of those ways. That is not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying, I am the way and the life and the, uh, the truth and the life. No one comes through the Father but through me. You know, we don't have this happening near as often as what it used to happen, but you remember, uh, many, many, most of you perhaps would, will remember when people used to stop and ask directions. I mean, nowadays we got GPS, we got GPS, you know, a lot of you got it in the dash of your car, but others of us, you know, it's in our smartphone, our cell phone, all we got to do is punch in, you know. Um, an intersection or an address or something or other, and, and GPS is going to tell us how to get there. Well, you know, it wasn't that long ago you didn't have a little tool like that at your disposal. And you remember what used to happen? You know, you, you if, uh, of course, some of you, Joe, being stubborn as you are, probably didn't do this, but, but, 
um, some of the guys in here maybe wouldn't do this, but you stop and ask directions, right? And you probably had people when you were at your workplace or something come walking in the front door, and they're asking directions somewhere. Let's just take, for example, that there's some light bulb company, okay? Such and such light bulb company. But someone stops by, you know, back in the day, and they're saying, oh, I'm trying to go to such and such light bulb company, but uh, I know it's somewhere over in this area, but I just really don't know where. Can you help me out with that? And the answer would be, oh, sure, sure. Yeah, what you need to do is you need to go down this four-lane road here. And uh, let's see, I think this is. Yeah, this is Johnson Drive. I'm pretty sure that's true. Johnson Drive. You go down this Johnson Drive, and you'll go down one, two, three, four stoplights. No, wait. I think it's three stoplights. You go three stoplights, and then you'll turn left, and then you're going to go um, five or six blocks. Just look for the yellow house, the big yellow house that's sitting there on the corner. It's got some dilapidated shit behind it, but, but I mean, it's just, it's sickening, you know, bright yellow. Just look for that. And so the first road, the second road street right after the yellow house, you turn right and you'll go down this hill and there's this little bridge uh, that you'll go over. Make sure you go over the little bridge because if you turn before the little bridge, then you've turned too early and you're not going to get to such and such light bulb company. And so you go through that, that over that little bridge and then as you're cresting, starting to get to the top of the hill, turn left and just look for a big light bulb sign and you'll have it. You remember the day when those were the directions? You know, it was, it, it was for me, you know, a few years back, I spent 10 years of my life living in a rural area where, I mean, there was a quarter of a mile, if not a half mile between houses. I mean, because it was a farming area. And if you think it was kind of funny the way people gave directions in areas like this, you should have heard the kind of directions that were given back then in the country because the direction sometimes you know i being a pastor in a church needed to go to someone's house so i'd ask a couple of the older guys in the church saying hey do you know where where uh, you know uh, uh, the old retired doc doc jones you know where where he lives because i need to stop by his house oh yeah i know where where he lives you just get out of here on highway 94 and you go down the road and uh, you're going to go here about four miles you know, I, on second thought, it might be five, five or six miles. Anyway, you know, it's right, it's right where uh, the Barkley homestead was, that great big two-story farmhouse. It was bulldozed over a few years ago. But that's the road you turn left on, and then you go down the... No kidding. Those were some of the directions I was given. You know, and I'm thinking, like, I... I've only been here after the bulldozing. I have no clue, you know, where that spot is. Well, just for the record, that is not what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is not giving directions. He is claiming to be the direction. You know, Thomas asked the question, well, we don't know the way, tell us the way. And Jesus basically is saying, you're looking at it. I'm the way. This is how you get there, through me. But here's the thing. You must receive him. And I put that in bold because that is something that I want to make sure that when you leave this place today that you will remember this because everything is building up to this point. You must receive him. It's not something that's going to happen automatically. You may have had a very godly grandmother that prayed a lot and, and uh, encouraged you. And when you would spend a couple weeks at her house in the summer, she'd take you to her church or vacation Bible school or whatever. You, you may have had that and that godly influence as the matriarch in the family. But I'm sorry to tell you that she could not make the decision for you as much as she might have wanted to. And your mom, your dad, nope. Your spouse, nope. You must receive him. Let me show you a scripture. John begins 
and I referenced this recently, he begins his gospel differently than the other three gospels. They all talk about stuff about Jesus being born in Bethlehem in a manger and stuff like that. John's looking more at the big picture. That's why he starts out, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know, he's talking about Jesus, big picture-wise, way back before Bethlehem. Well, here is what he says. The whole chapter is, is, is being used in this way. But in verse 10, we read this. He, and he's talking about Jesus, was in the world, and the world was created through him. Yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and that primarily is a thought, that he came to the Jewish people. And his own people did not receive him. Now, there were some that did, a few that did. But by and large, most didn't. Those, those are a couple of the saddest verses that you're going to read in the Bible. Jesus made the world, he came into the world, but the world didn't recognize its maker, its creator. And so they did not receive him. That certainly describes things back in the first century, but don't limit it to that. It describes every era of time, including the one that we're living in right now. But the passage isn't done. Because verses 12 and 13 continue the thought, but there's a contrast here, a turning point. And that's why the word but is found there. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. There's the contrast. And there is the good news. You know, this whole thought about universalism, about about how, well, you know what, we may have various different beliefs and there may be different religions in the world, but the reality is, you know, everyone's going to end up in the same place. God's going to receive us all. And, and, uh, yep, passages like this say, "Uh uh-uh. Nope. This, this passage doesn't support that in any way, shape, or form. We need to receive him. That's clearly what is being taught here. Now, receiving him, what does that look like? Well, to break that down just a little bit using different terminology, I would say it like this. That means we need to, first of all, recognize who he is. Who is Jesus? Because that's really what John chapter 1 is all about. John chapter 1 is trying to open people's eyes to understand that Jesus was more than just a man. He was a man, but he was more than just a man. He was more than just a devout rabbi. He was more than just a godly prophet. He was more than all of that. And that's why I said in the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was God. And then a few verses later, it says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We need to receive who he is. We need to embrace and understand, accept who he is. Remember that time when Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they, they you know, started spitting back different responses. Well, some say John the Baptist, some say Jeremiah, some say Elijah or one of the prophets. And then Jesus got to the very heart of the matter with the audience that he was talking to at the time. He said, but who do you say that I am? And then that's when Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Nailed it. And that's why the good confession, like what we heard up here earlier, is repeated to this day. Because we need to recognize who he is. But it goes beyond that, because even demons recognize who he is, right? Right? We need to rely on what he has done. 
And what I'm talking about here is in regards to, to why it was that he came into the world to begin with, what his mission was. His mission was all about what ended up culminating on the cross, followed by his resurrection. That's why he came into the world, and that explains why when he was being arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and Peter pulled out a knife and tried to intervene and, you know, to make it so Jesus wouldn't have to be arrested, what was it Jesus said to Peter? Put away your knife. Jesus understood fully what was about to happen needed to happen. And we're talking about not just his arrest, but his crucifixion, his death, followed by his resurrection. This is the reason why when John the Baptist first saw Jesus, you know, coming at, at, at the, that point in time when Jesus' public ministry was going to begin, John saw Jesus approaching and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's what John was referencing. Though John didn't understand, he was inspired to say that, he couldn't have understood the ramifications, the details that were associated with that. There is a word that is found in the Bible that is a 50-cent word. It's one of the biggest uh, words that at least I've, you know, wrestled with at various times, you know, in, in reading through that portion of the Scripture it, in a couple of translations is the word propitiation. Now, that is a big 50-cent word. Um, the NIV, for example, uses the word atonement there. But this is what that is talking about. It is talking about how Jesus, when he came, he lived that perfect life, qualifying him to offer that ultimate perfect sacrifice, the unblemished sacrifice that had been basically foreshadowed and foretold in all of these earlier pages of the Bible. Jesus, you know, was qualified to offer that ultimate sacrifice, and in so doing, he took upon himself our sin and the ultimate consequence of the sin, separation from God, condemnation, he took that upon himself, and he paid that price, and he rose victorious on the third day. And in exchange to all of those who receive him, he has given his righteousness. The great exchange. His death was a substitutionary death. That's what's wrapped up in this word propitiation, or some translations, expiation, or the word atonement. So not only do we need to recognize who he is, we need to rely on what he has done, what he accomplished on our behalf. And then thirdly, resolve to live for him. It's no longer my will, it's your will. You died for me, I'm going to live for you. And this is all wrapped up in what receiving him is all about. Receiving him is not a one-time isolated thing that you do at a certain point in time on the timeline of your life, and then once you've done it, you're good to go, and you can go about doing whatever you want to do, kind of like playing Monopoly, and you get that get-out-of-jail-free card. You can stick that in your back pocket just in case you need it. The time arises, then, oh, yeah, and you pull it out. And no, that's not what we're talking about here. Receiving him is something that impacts, then, the rest of your life. Paul described that in Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7, when he said, So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Just as you received him, continue. Follow through. This is something now, from this point moving forward, is, is impacting your approach to life. Now, I'm not saying that you've got to live a perfect life. But, I mean, that, that's what you're striving for, to his glory. But the reality of the matter is you're not going to accomplish that. You're not going to live a perfect life. But you're, you're following through. Because now, 
what is the heartbeat of your life, which we talked about a couple Sundays ago, what God wants. I mean, that, that's what it's all about now because you no longer live for yourself. So back to the verse that we began with. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Boy, it makes perfect sense, especially after having gone down this path and talked about some of these other teachings that are found in Scripture. The crucified part, we get that, you know, the cross. We've all, you know, know what that entailed, at least to a degree. We get certain images that come to our mind. Unfortunately, some of these images, you know, aren't entirely realistic. But, you know, because we think about a cross and, and crosses, the majority of the time we see them, they're smooth, they're, they're you know, nice and sanded and, and uh, polished and, you know, I mean, most times when you see a cross, whether it be some, hanging on someone's wall or it's a part of some jewelry or something or other they're wearing, that's the way the cross comes across. But that's not at all what a cross was like. In fact, you maybe, maybe you've never heard this before, but uh, back, back at that point in time in history, 2,000 years ago, um, the Romans were very good at recycling. They recycled crosses. When a cross was used and someone was crucified, it wasn't like the cross was disposed of. It was used again for the next crucifixion. And it was used again. And so the likelihood is that the cross that Jesus was crucified on, that there was dried blood from who knows how many other people before him that had been crucified. As a matter of fact, the crosses would have been rough enough and big enough splinters and stuff like that, that there there very well could have been flesh, ribbons of flesh, dried and still attached to the very cross that Jesus was nailed to. Yeah, we're not talking about something that's very pretty. But yet that's what Jesus went. That's what Jesus came into the world. To do, not because it sounded fun, but because he knew you needed him to do that. That's why it happened. Our ushers are going to be getting up this time and preparing for communion. And I just want to end my thoughts by saying this, and some of you have heard me say this before, but while we're talking about the cross, let me say this. What we see when we rifle in on the cross of Jesus is we see the wrath of God at its worst, at its harshest. But simultaneously, we see the love of God at its best. In why what was happening was happening. It was happening for your benefit and for my benefit. He did that for us. But we need to embrace it. We need to receive him and and what he did on our behalf. You know, it is true. Salvation is a free gift. Yeah, it's a free gift driven by the love and the grace of God, it is a free gift. But never make the mistake in thinking that because it's a free gift, it's cheap. There is nothing cheap about salvation. The highest price ever paid for anything is what he paid for you. And if you have never embraced that, if you have never received him, I don't know what you're waiting for. I wouldn't let another week go by before I do that. There's nothing more important you can do in your life than embracing Jesus Christ. Do that if you haven't thus far. Let's pray.